Hello, welcome to a new section of the .NET MAUI course. In this section, you're going to learn everything you need to know to work with the collection view control. We cannot deny that the lists in applications are one of the most used resources to create graphical interfaces. That is why I think it is very important to master this control to be able to create any design that we propose. Previously, we have seen that there are two controls that allow us the management of collections. So you may be wondering which one to use? To find out, let's look at some of the features of the collection view, which make it different from a list view. First of all, with a list view control, you can only define vertical lists, which may limit the application layouts you build. The collection view control, on the other hand, has a flexible design model allowing information to be presented either horizontally, vertically, in a list, or in the form of a grid. Another advantage of the collection view control is that it supports single and multiple selection. In addition, the collection view control automatically uses the virtualization provided by the underlying native controls, making it a high-performance control. The last feature of the collection view is that it does not use the view cell concept that is used in a list view. Instead, the layout of a row is defined directly in the data template of the control. We can list more features, but the previous ones are the most important ones. With this, we can conclude that it is better to use the collection view control over the list view control in .NET MAUI applications. We are going to begin to study the collection view control in depth, and for it, we are going to create a new project inside Visual Studio, selecting the template .NET MAUI app, naming it as Collection View Demo. Let's click on Next, and finally on Create to carry out the creation of this project. Previously, we have seen how to create a collection view control as part of the graphical interface. In this module, the idea is that you specialize in the use of this control so that you know how to customize it and how to deal with different scenarios using this control. To do this, let's create the MVVM folder as part of the project. And inside it, let's create the views folder to finally create the content page called data view. Subsequently, Let's create a new folder inside the MVVM folder called View Models. And inside, let's create a new class called Data View Model. Let's convert the class into a public class. And once we have created the View Model, let's go back to the dataview.saml.cs file. Here, let's assign the binding context to a new instance of Data View Model. Let's import the required namespace and finally, Set this page as the initial page in the app.saml.cs file. Let's write data view. Here, we must be careful to select the namespace of the project, not this one that says system.data, because it is another namespace. Once we have the new page assigned as initial page, let's go back to the dataview.saml file and remove the vertical stack layout that appears by default and in its place, let's create a collection view. Once we have defined the collection view, we need to specify a data source in order to create a binding between this page and the data source. As part of the MVVM folder, let's create a new folder called Models. And inside the folder, let's create a new class called Product. In this class, we're going to define a set of properties, among them a name property, another property called price, another property called image, another property called stock, the has offer property, and the offer price property, which will be used to create the graphical interface of the application. Once we have created the model, we're going to return to the view model, where we will create an observable collection. We have to import the namespace that is needed, and we're going to indicate that we want a list of products, that is the class that we have just created. Let's name the list products with its get and set. Next, we're going to initialize the listing from the constructor of the view model. Let's create then the constructor, and I'm going to paste a code that is somewhat extensive, in which the creation of different products that are added to the collection is performed. 
That is to say, a new instance of the product list is created and it is initialized. I want you to see something special. As part of the creation of the products, a property called has offer is specified, which indicates whether a product is on offer or not. And as part of the listing, there are some products that have the property in false and other products with that true value. When one of the products has a true value, offer price is assigned, which will allow us to get products that are on sale with its price. You can download this code as part of the attach file of this class or at the end of the section. Once we have initialized the list of products, we're going to return to the XAML file where we have previously defined the collection view control and if you remember, we have a property called items source which allows us to indicate what will be the source of information for the elements of the control. In our case, we're going to create a binding to the property called products which is the collection that we have created previously. I'm going to start the application to see how it looks like. And once we initialize the application, we can already see the set of products that have been loaded in the list that we created with the problem that the name of the complete type of the object is displayed. We must define the graphical appearance of the elements, which we will do in the next video. We are going to define the visual appearance of the products in the list. To do this, I'm going to stop the execution of the application. I'm going to go to the Solution Explorer and inside the folder called Resources, I'm going to import a set of images in the Images folder. It's this set of images that I've imported, each with a descriptive name according to a product. Once I have imported the images, I'm going to define an item template in the collection view which is going to be used to define the visual appearance of each one of the rows of the collection view control. Let's assign to the item template property a data template, which is the graphical template for each row. To make a test, we can start defining a label control with the text equal to and creating a binding to name, which is one of the properties of the products. This is to make sure that the application works correctly. With this that we have done, we can see again the list, but being shown what is the name of each product. This is because we have created a data template. The next step is to improve the list aesthetically. And for this, we're going to modify the data template. Instead of the label control, we're going to create a grid, assigning it some properties. For example, a margin with the values 15, 10, 15, 0. Let's also assign its calming definition with the value dot one asterisk comma dot two asterisk and dot seven asterisk. That is, we are creating three columns with different percentages. Let's also create a couple of rows within the grid that are the same size. Inside the grid, let's define a control frame to give a nice visual appearance to our application. Let's assign a row span equal to two and a grid dot column equal to one to position the frame in column number one. Let's also set grid dot column span equal to two and a border color equal to white. Once we have defined the frame, we're going to place a gradient as background through frame dot background. Let's create a linear gradient brush with an endpoint equal to one comma zero and let's define a gradient stop with an offset equal to zero. With a color equal to F8, F9, FA. Let's copy the gradient stop, change the offset to a value one, and finally the value to a value DEE2E6. Once we have defined the background for the control frame, let's create an image control. Notice that this control is inside the grid and not inside the frame. The frame will only serve to define the background of the rows. The image control must have a row span equal to 2, a column span equal to 2, so that it uses two rows and two columns, a height request equal to 100, and a source equal to binding image, which is a property of the model. I'm going to start the application so you can see how it looks. We can see how the list is displayed with the images that have a circular shape. 
we see the background with the gradient of the frame control and look how the image protrudes to the left side of each of the rows. This is because we are indicating that the frame is going to be placed in column number 1 while the image has a column equal to 0 by default because we are not specifying it. This is what is causing the image to be seen coming out of the frame, giving a nice effect that gives it a very nice visual appearance. Next, let's define the text elements, that is to say, after the image control, let's create a label control, assigning a column equal to 2, font size equal to large, and let's bind the text property with the name property of the model. Finally, let's set the vertical options property equal to center. With these changes, we can see the name of the product in each of the elements of the list. Let's copy the label control, let's paste it, let's change some properties such as grid row equal to 1, grid dot column equal to 2, font size equal to large, and in this control, let's set the binding to the price property, which shows us the decimal value corresponding to the price of the product. In our case, we want to display a currency format for the price, so we will apply a string format equal to place single quotes inside a pair of braces, a number zero followed by a column and the capital letter C, which applies the currency format in each of the values. With this, we have defined the visual appearance of each of the rows of the list. Previously, we have seen in the section of the styles that to assign values to the properties of the controls directly is not something very advisable, especially if we're going to reuse the design in other applications, in other pages, and even if we want to use several designs in a same collection view, which we're going to see in the following video. Let's see how to create a resource dictionary as part of the application to maintain the data templates of the collection views. I'm going to stop the execution of the application and I'm going to create a new file in the styles folder. We are going to add a new file using the resource dictionary template called collection view dictionary. Once we have created the file, remember to do some additional steps by first deleting the file with the CS extension as well as the X class attribute. I'm also going to paste this line that will allow us to compile the resource dictionary. Inside this file, we're going to move the data template from the collection we created previously. That is to say, I'm going to select all the data template tag. I cut the code section and paste it into the resource dictionary. We can see an error that tells us that all the objects that are added to a dictionary must have an X key attribute or some type of key associated to them. That is, we must define an X key for the data template. Let's give the data template an X key that is equal to product style. Once we have defined the data template in the resource dictionary, let's go back to the XAML file. We may see an error because we have left the item template property without content. Let's remove the property and instead Let's use the property in this way, assigning to the item play property a static resource equal to product style. This way, look how the code is extremely clean. The last thing we need to do is to add this resource dictionary as part of the dictionary merge. For this, we go to the app.saml file. I'm going to duplicate this line and change the source to the collection view dictionary.saml file. I'm going to make sure that the name is the same as the file and let's start the execution of the application. Once we initialize the application, see how we have the same visual appearance of the list with the great difference that we already have the style centralized in a single file, which will allow us to use this style in other collections in the application or to change the style of the design in a simple way from a single place. When developing mobile applications, there will be times when you will need to display a different layout for some rows with certain characteristics. For example, previously we have defined a data template to display a product from the catalog. Now, these products have a property to know if they are on offer or not. 
If one of the products has an offer, we could display a different design for that product. We will achieve this thanks to a data template selector. Thanks to the use of a data template selector, we will be able to create a different design that attracts more attention so that the user knows that he is in front of an offer. Let's learn how to do this with .NET MAUI. Once we have created the list of products, you may remember that the products have a property called has offer, which allows us to know if a product is on offer or not. Ideally, as part of the application, we can show a different format for the products on offer so that the user can recognize them quickly. How can we do this with a listing in .NET MAUI? Well, let's stop the execution of the application and let's create a folder in the project called selectors. As part of this folder, let's create a new class called product data template selector. Let's make the class public and indicate that the class will inherit from a class called data template selector. This is a special class that will allow us to select a data template at runtime to apply to each of the list items. You can see that we have an error in the class since we must implement the missing member because the data template selector class is an abstract class. Let Visual Studio help us to implement this abstract class. This generates a method that will allow us to go through each of the elements of the list to decide at runtime which data template should be applied. You can see that as part of this method, Two parameters are received. The first parameter of type object called item refers to each type of element in the list. In this case, it is a product. Another parameter called container is also defined, which is of type bindable object, which refers to the collection type control that is being traversed. Let's implement this method that we are going to do is get the product reference through the creation of a variable called product which is equal to item as product. We have to import the namespace that is needed and once we obtain the product, we are going to validate if the has offer property has a false value. That is to say, if it is a product that is not in offer to apply the item template that we have created previously. In case it is a product without offer, we're going to access the application.current.resources class and we're going to use the try get value method to try to obtain the style called product style, which, as you may remember, is the name we assign to the data template in the dictionary. Then, in case the resource is found, we will store it in a variable called product style. Once this is done, we will return the resource through product style as data template. With this, we are going to return what is the style we want to apply to a product that does not have an offer. You could use any type of validation that you need, for example, to compare a property, to compare if a reference is null or not, if a value is less than another value, or any other comparison that you want. We can see a problem that is indicating us that not all the roots are returning a value. This is because we are using an if. Therefore, in the case that a product does have an offer, we will simply return a new data template temporarily. Once we have done this, we must use this data template selector as part of the XAML file. Let's go to the data view file and let's declare a namespace called data templates, which is equal to clr hyphen namespace colon. Let's type the name of the project which is collection view demo. And as part of the Visual Studio hints, we see the namespace we're interested in, which ends in selectors. So let's select it. Once we have created the namespace, let's create a resource as part of the content page through data templates. Let's use the product data template selector class and assign an X key equal to product templates. Previously, to the collection view control, we had assigned an item template property specifying the style we wanted to use for each of the rows. However, since we now want to assign the style dynamically, we cannot use a single style, but instead 
we will use the data template selector that we have previously created through the reference in the resources section. Let's assign static resource product template. Let's add an S at the end. Once we've done that, I'm going to go to the data template selector so you can see what the flow of operation of the class is. I'm going to start the application running. And once the application has been initialized, look at how we immediately get to the breakpoint that we created previously, where we see that it's about applying a style to one of the products. We see that the specific product has some properties that are what we're seeing on the screen. This specific product does not have an offer, so the flow enters the if. The style is obtained through this method and the style to be applied to this element is returned. I'm going to continue with the execution of the application and we can see the style being applied. Perhaps you may think that there is no difference with what we have done previously. However, look how from time to time there is a larger space between the elements since this space is the one that should be occupying one of the elements with an offer which, remember, temporarily we create a new unformatted data template. Here we can see another larger space which is where another element should exist. The next step is to create the layout for each of the elements on offer. In this video we're going to see how we can create and apply a second data template to the collection view. For this, let's create a second data template inside the resource dictionary that we created earlier. I'm going to create a second data template. Let's assign an X key equal to offer style. As part of the data template, I will create a label control with a text equal to a binding to the name property to check that everything works correctly. Once we have created the second data template, let's return to the item template selector and after performing the validation through the if, let's indicate that in case a product does have an offer, I will copy this section above where we get the resource and let's change the name of the resource to offer style. Let's specify that the output variable is going to be equal to offer style, which we will return as a data template. With this change made, let's start the execution of the application. See how this time, in the list, the products in offer are already displayed. We no longer have an empty space, but we can already see what is the name of the products. Let's improve the visual layout for each of these rows by going back to the dictionary file. I'm going to copy the data template section, that is, this grid layout, and I'm going to paste it as part of the second data template. I'm going to change some properties, for example the column definitions property, to specify two columns, one with 30% and the second with 70% space. As part of the frame, I'm going to remove the grid.column property so that it occupies all the available space. To the image control that we see in the part of below, I'm going to remove the column span. I'm going to change also the colors of the linear gradient brush using a color FFBF47 and a second color equal to EEB54C. We will also make the grid bigger through the height request property with a value equal to 200. Also, to the first label that is immediately after the image control, we will assign a font size equal to title to make the text bigger, a font attributes with a bold value and a text color equal to white. These three properties, font size, font attributes, and text color, we're going to apply them also to the second label control. I'm going to replace this font size by pasting the properties. Another thing we have to do is to indicate to the user that this is an offer. So, to this first label control, I'm going to change the binding by applying a string format equal to single quotes. I'm going to place a pair of braces and inside the value 0, which indicates the position of the name string. With this, before the name we can add the string offer colon, which will show the word offer before the product name. 
Another thing that would be very good to show is the original price of the product crossed out so that the user can see that it is a good offer. We can do this inside this label control, but not through the creation of a normal label. But we have to create a formatted text to be able to create two sections in a string, each one with a different style. So let's access the formatted text property of the label control, where we must create a section of the formatted string type, which will allow us to create span type elements, specifying a text which we will copy from the previously assigned binding. I'm going to close this label and the first span is going to have a binding to the offer price property. Let's duplicate this line and the second span is going to have a binding to the price property, which is the original price. We are going to leave the string format, but to this span we are going to add a set of properties such as text decorations equal to strike through, which will allow us to cross out the price. Let's also apply a different text color, for example a dark red color, to highlight the offer even more. With these changes applied, let's start running the application. We can see how the products on offer are displayed with a totally different layout. They are rows that are quite eye-catching for the user and that show both the price on offer and the original price crossed out. This is how we can create different styles for each of the rows. You can create as many styles as you want to apply in your collection views. An extremely useful feature is to be able to update the list of data when we need, for example, to query a remote database for updates. This is an activity that is very easy to perform with .NET MAUI. Let's see how to do it. I'm going to stop the execution of the project and as part of the dataview.saml file where we have defined the collection view, I'm going to create a control called refresh view which is going to allow us to update the data of a collection view in a very simple way. We must nest inside the control refresh view, the control collection view, so that this works correctly. As part of the refresh view control, we have a property called command, which we will be able to bind to a command. We're going to assign the command refresh command to it. We also have a second property called is refreshing which is going to allow us to show the user if the control is in the process of being refreshed. We are going to create a binding to the is refreshing property, which is not yet defined in the view model. Let's define this pair of properties in the view model. To do this, we go to the data view model file and in the property section, define a boolean property called is refreshing, with its get and set to control the refreshing process. Subsequently, we're going to define the command through public i command. Let's import the required namespace and create the refresh command, which was the name specified in the SAML file. Let's create a new command and a lambda expression without parameters. Once this is done, let's create a method that allows us to perform the simulation of a data refresh. Therefore, we're going to define a private void method called refresh items. Inside this method, we're going to cut the creation of the list of products that we currently have in the constructor. Once we have done this from the constructor, we're going to invoke the new refresh items method. Once we have made the changes, let's go back to the command and invoke from here also the refresh items method to invoke it every time we carry out the refreshing of information. Now, to carry out the simulation of obtaining data remotely, let's insert and await task.delay, passing a value 3000 to wait 3 seconds before invoking the method, in order to see the refresh view control in action. To activate the refreshing mode of the refresh view, we're going to use the is refreshing property to indicate that the control is in a refreshing state before starting the invocation of the refresh items method. And we're going to assign a false value after carrying out the invocation to the method. Finally, so that we do not have problems with the update in the graphical interface, we're going to install the FODI package. 
Once the package is installed, I'm going to add the add I notify property changed interface attribute to the view model. Let's import the namespace that is needed and start the application running. Once the application has been loaded, if we scroll the listing down, look how this animation appears that is telling us that the update process is going to start. The update process is maintained for 3 seconds and once the 3 seconds pass, the list is updated through the method we created. This is how the refresh view control is integrated with the collection view control. In the previous videos, you have seen how we have loaded the list of products at the beginning of the application. However, this could represent a serious performance problem if you have many elements. For example, suppose you develop a WhatsApp type application in which multiple messages from a conversation must be loaded. Ideally, these messages should be loaded incrementally and not all of them at the start of the application since it could even cause the application to close immediately. Let's see how to implement incremental data loading. I'm going to stop the execution of the application and I'm going to modify the method called refresh items, adding an integer parameter called last index with a default value of zero. This parameter is going to be used to know which was the last item loaded in the list. Then we're going to define a variable called number of items per page, which has an initial value of 10 and is of integer type. Subsequently, we're going to create a variable called items, to which we will assign the creation of the collection of products. Then I'm going to cut the creation of the collection and I'm going to paste it as the assignment of the variable items. I'm going to remove this line. And what we're going to do next is to create a filter to the list of items to obtain the products 10 by 10. For this, I'm going to create a new variable called page items that is equal to we access to the collection through items and use the skip method that is going to allow us to skip a certain amount of elements. In this case, we're going to use the parameter last index that, remember, is the value that stores which was the last element obtained from the list that we can use to indicate the amount of elements that we are going to skip to take the following 10 elements using the value of the variable number of times per page. We can change this value if we need to. What we're going to do next is go through the list of products obtained from the filter. This is because we're going to add to the products property the 10 new products obtained. Let's go to the products property and initialize the collection so we don't have problems with null references. The next thing we're going to do is to go to the dataview.saml file and we're going to configure the control to use the incremental loading. First, let's use the remaining items threshold property, which is going to allow us to specify the number of items that have not yet been displayed, that when this number is reached, the new items will be loaded. Let's assign a value of 1. With this, what we're doing is to indicate that when one element is left to be displayed in the control, it will start processing the loading of the next 10 elements. The next step is to define the remaining items threshold reach command property, which will allow us to create a binding to a command to determine an action to be performed when the specified threshold is reached. Let's create a binding to the threshold reach command. Let's copy the name of the command, go back to the view model and create the command through public i command, paste the name of the command. Let's create a new command with an asynchronous lambda expression with no parameters. I'm going to leave the command empty initially, so you can see that the initial load is working correctly. I'm going to start the execution of the application. And if we scroll down in the collection, you can see how only 10 items are being loaded. If we try to go further down, we can't because only the first 10 items have been loaded. Let's stop the execution of the application and in the command, let's invoke the refresh items method 
passing the product.count parameter, that is, the number of products contained in the collection, which will be skipped, resulting in the next 10 items. We're going to start once again the execution of the application. And look how this time, if we scroll down, more items are already being loaded correctly. This is how we can create an incremental load in a collection view control. Finally, it is necessary to emphasize that this method that I defined previously that returns us of 10 in 10 elements could be in an external service, returning certain amount of elements from a database, for example, and to carry out the incremental load in the collection view to go displaying the new information. In a collection view, we can also add sliding menus thanks to the use of the swipe view control. This is very common in email applications, for example, where you can scroll each email and decide which option to use. For example, forward an email or reply to it. Let's see how to implement this with the collection view. What we're going to do is to go to the resource dictionary that we have created for the data templates. That is to say, we go to the file collection view dictionary. Once we have opened this file, inside the data template file, where we have this grid element, we're going to place a swipe view control. Let's nest the grid inside the swipe view. Inside the swipe view control, let's specify the location in which the swipe items will appear through the left items property, to place the options to the left of each element. Subsequently, we must define the swipe item stack, and inside we're going to define a single swipe item, placing it a background color equal to dark red. Let's assign to the command property a binding to the delete command. And we will also specify an icon image source equal to .NET bot, which is the image included by default in the application. You can replace this image with a more descriptive image, such as a trash can. Once we have defined the swipe item control, let's go back to the view model, which is the data view model file, and create a new command through public i command delete command, which is equal to a new instance of a command. Let's pass a lambda expression that does not receive parameters, and in the command, let's create a variable equal to one to check that the command execution works correctly. Let's start the execution of the application. Once the application has been deployed, we can see that if we drag the element to the right, we already have available the swipe item on which we can click, but we see that nothing happens even when we have placed a breakpoint in the view model. Let's see why this is happening. I'm going to stop the execution of the application and go back to the data view file. You can see that as part of the collection view, we are associating an item source to the product property. This means that from the binding context that we established in the code behind, a list of products is used for the collection view control. On the other hand, in the data template, we are trying to use a command called delete command, which is being searched in the products property. As you may well remember, this products property is actually a list of products. Therefore, this command does not really exist in the products property. What we have to do is to indicate which is the view model in which is the command that we want to execute when we click on one of the swipe items. How can we do this? Well, let's go back to the resource dictionary. In the location of the command where we assign the binding to the lead command, we're going to assign a binding to. Let's use the source property. Between a pair of braces, we write relative source, space, ancestor type, and between another pair of braces, we must indicate which is the type of the view model, which contains the command we need. To have a direct access to the view model, we go to the resource dictionary. And in the namespaces, we are going to write xmlns colon, we're going to assign a name that can be the one you want. In my case, I'm going to use view models, which is going to be equal to clr hyphen namespace colon, 
and Visual Studio shows us the namespaces that we could use. In our case, the project is called Collection View Demo, and let's indicate that we want to use this namespace where the view models are located. Once we have defined the namespace, we're going to use it through ancestor type x colon type space access the namespace that is view model and use the view model called data view model, which is the one associated to this content page. Subsequently, after the second brace that closes, we're going to assign a path equal to and we must specify the name of the command that we want to use, which in our case is delete command. We're going to save the changes, seeing that there is no problem or error. With the breakpoint that we have established previously, we're going to start again the execution of the application. Let's press on the swipe item and see that in this occasion, we are already stopping in the breakpoint. The only thing that is necessary is to obtain the product on which we're going to make some action. There is a very simple way to pass as parameter of the command what is this element. We're going to do it through command parameter, creating a binding. With this, the element to which the swipe item belongs will be passed to the command. Let's go back to the view model and in the command let's add a parameter in the lambda expression called P. Let's remove this test line and proceed to remove from the product list the product obtained through the command. We have to perform a conversion of the variable P to a product type to match the types. And once we've done that, I'm going to remove the breakpoint. I'm going to start the execution of the application. Let's try to remove one of the elements. And look how this time the item that we clicked on the swipe item has been removed. We can do the same action on another one of the products. And look how the swipe item that we have created for each product in the list is already working correctly. Once we have seen how to work with data in the collection view, it is time to see how to work with the layouts available in .NET MAUI for the collection view control. To carry out this demonstration, I'm going to create a new page as part of the project. That is, in the folder MVVM, I'm going to create a content page in the Views folder, which I'm going to call Layouts page. Once we have created the file, let's go to the code behind of the page. Let's assign the binding context to be equal to a new instance of data view model. To reuse this view model and not to have to create a new view model. Next, let's go to the SAML file. Let's remove the default vertical stack layout and let's create instead a collection view with an item source equal to a binding to the product property. Let's define an item template as part of the collection view and inside a data template, creating the layout for each of the rows through a frame with a margin equal to 15, a width equal to 200, and a height request equal to 250. Inside the frame, we're going to create a vertical stack layout with a pair of controls, an image control with a source equal to binding image. We are also going to create a label control with its horizontal text alignment equal to center, and finally a text property equal to a binding to the name property. Once we have created the collection view, we're going to place this page as initial page. That is to say, we go to the app.saml.cs file and we're going to establish the layout page as initial page. Let's start the execution of the application. And we can already see the list of products that we have seen previously being displayed in the collection view. With this, we can see that the default layout of a collection view is a vertical list. We can go back to the SAML file and specify this layout explicitly through a property called items layout. The value will be equal to vertical list. And with this, we see exactly the same visual result with the difference that we have explicitly stated that we want to use this layout. We can change the vertical list value to the horizontal list value. And if we save the changes, we can see how the collection view has a different layout 
which is a horizontal list with the same data template. There is a second way to specify the layout of a collection view. Let's remove the property we assigned previously and access the items layout property. Inside this tag, we must specify what type of layout we want to use. In our case, as we are studying the horizontal and vertical list, we are going to use a linear items layout. We must specify which is the orientation that we need for the layout, that is to say, if we need a horizontal or vertical orientation. Let's try the vertical orientation. And with this change, we can see again the list with a vertical layout. Let's change the value to horizontal and we see how the layout changes again to a horizontal format. We also have available a property called item spacing, which we can change to add a space between each of the elements. For example, let's use a value equal to 50. And in this way, we see how the spacing between each of the elements has increased. This is how we can create linear lists. As part of the collection view control, it is also possible to define a grid format for the list, which is very easy to do. What we have to do is to change the linear items layout for a grid items layout in the collection view. We must specify the orientation either vertical or horizontal. In this case, we're going to use a vertical orientation and see how here we have a problem because when we use a grid items layout, we cannot use the item spacing property, but we must use either the horizontal item spacing or vertical item spacing properties. For the moment, we are not going to use these properties, but if we save the changes, see how in the listing it seems that nothing has happened. It seems that we have a linear items layout in the collection view. This is happening because we need to assign a property to indicate the amount of columns that we need in the grid. We can do this specifying a property called span in the grid items layout. That is going to allow us to specify the amount of columns when we work with a vertical orientation. In this case, see how the elements are already distributed in a grid. We can change the span value to a value of 3. And in this case, we already have three columns. Let's remove the height request and with request properties from the frame to let the framework itself take care of resizing the controls. If we wanted a grid in horizontal format, we would have to change the orientation value to horizontal, specifying a span as well. We see how the grid has three columns that have been created. I'm going to assign a couple of frame properties to reset the elements, that is, a width that is equal to 200 and a height that is equal to 250 units. With that change that we have applied, we are going to save the changes. And now we can see the collection view control with three rows and several columns created in which the products have been distributed. This is how we can create lists with a grid format in the collection view control. Another thing that is possible to do with a collection view control is to add a header and a footer to the control. Let's see how to do it. Let's go back to the items layout tag and indicate that we want to use a linear items layout. Let's remove the span property and set the orientation equal to vertical. As part of the collection view, we have a property called header to which we can assign a text such as product. We also have a property called footer, to which we can also assign a text, for example, end of list. If we start the execution of the application with this pair of properties that we have added, we can see the list and at the top, look how the text appears with the string we specified. If we scroll down, we can see that at the end of the listing, we have the text that we also indicated above. We have done this thanks to the pair of properties we added. Now, what if you don't like the default footer and header design? Well, one advantage is that we can customize them. How can we do this? Well, I'm going to remove the pair of properties that I defined previously. And as part of the collection view, 
we have access to the header property in which we are going to be able to define the appearance of the header. For example, we can create a frame with a background color equal to static resource primary. Inside the frame, let's add a label control with its font attributes equal to bold, a text equal to products, which was the text that we used previously, and a text color equal to white, so that it has a good contrast with the background color. If we start the execution of the application, we can see how the header of the collection view has the design that we have specified. We're going to do the same with the footer of the collection view. Let's access it through collectionview.footer. Let's create a horizontal stack layout and inside a label control with font size equal to title. Let's also create a pair of spans as part of this label through formatted text. Inside we assign a formatted string where we will create a first span with a text equal to powered by colon and we're going to assign a text color equal to static resource tertiary. I'm going to duplicate the span element changing the text to .NET MAUI and the color to static resource primary. Once this is done, I will restart the application. If we scroll to the bottom, we can see the footer with the layout we have specified. This is the way in which we can add headers and footers to a collection view control. In this video, you will learn how to get an element of the collection view control from the view model. We're going to open the layouts page.saml file and as part of a collection view, we have a property called selection mode, to which we can assign the values multiple, known, and single. By default, the control has the value known selected, which avoids selecting an element of the collection view. It is for this reason that we cannot select the elements of the list when it is displayed. Let's change the value to a single value and let's start the execution of the application to see how it behaves. Once the application has been deployed, see that if we click on one of the elements, we can select it. I want to comment to you that at the moment there is a book in which the control frame does not allow us to select the element. If we click on the section of the frame, you can see that the element is not selected. I hope that when you see this video, this error has already been solved. I'm going to stop the execution of the application, and in case you want to get an element from the code behind, see that we have an element called selection changed, which allows us to create a new event handler. If we go to the code behind of the page, we can already see the event handler that has been created. The handler has a couple of parameters, the first one specifying which control is triggering the event and the second parameter of type selection changed event arcs, which contains several useful properties, of which the one we are interested in is the property called current selection, which will allow us to know which element has been selected. To test it, let's create a variable called element, which is equal to e.currentSelection. Let's place a breakpoint at the end of the event handler and start the execution of the application. Once the application has been deployed, if we click on one of the elements, see how the application stops at the breakpoint and we can get the information of the pressed element. Here we can see the properties of the element we have selected. Now, surely, what you need is to handle this event that we have used in a view model. Let's see how to do it. To do this, let's go back to the XAML file. Let's remove this event with its respective event handler. And instead, let's use a property called selected item, which we are going to be able to bind to a property called selected product. Once I've set this property, I'm going to copy the name of the binding property. I'm going to return to the view model of this page, that is to say to data view model. And I'm going to declare a public property that is of type product with the name selected product with its get and set. 
Something very important to take into account is that this property has to be of the same type of the element of the collection. That is to say, if as part of the collection we have a generic product, the selected product must be of this same type. Once we have done this, for demonstration purposes, I'm going to convert this property into a full property. Let's create a block body for the set. I'm going to place a breakpoint and start the execution of the application. Once the application has been deployed, if I click on one of the elements, look how we get to the breakpoint correctly. Again, we can see the set of properties that belong to the product that we have selected in the listing. Now, maybe what you would like as part of the listing is to be able to work with the property that has been selected. How can we do this? Well, as part of the collection view control, we also have a property called selection change command, which will fire the event that we saw earlier when we select one of the elements. We're going to create a binding to the product change command. I'm going to copy the name of the command, go back to the view model, and in the commands section, I'm going to define public i command, paste the name of the command, which is going to be equal to a new command with a lambda expression without parameters. And as part of the command, I'm going to declare a variable i equal to zero to test that everything works correctly. I'm going to place a breakpoint and let's test the application. I click on one of the elements and we can see how we get to the command correctly. The last thing we have to do is to get the reference of the element that we have selected. We can reuse what we have done before and access the selected product property to get the element that has been selected. I'm going to declare a variable called selected product, which is equal to selected product. This is for demonstration purposes. You can execute any operation you need in the command. With the application being executed, I click again on one of the elements. We stop at the breakpoint, and if we examine the variable, notice how we get the information of the product that we have selected. This is the way to obtain unique items from a list. Once we know how to get single items from the view model, let's learn how to get multiple items from a list. To do this, I'm going to stop the execution of the application. I'm going to go back to the XAML file and I'm going to comment out the collection view tag. I'm going to create a new collection view by assigning some properties such as the item source to be equal to products and the selection mode to be equal to multiple. Again, as part of the collection view, we have available the selection changed event. Let's use the event handler we created earlier. Let's review the code behind and let's see what happens with this breakpoint set. I'm going to select one of the elements. We reached the breakpoint and in the count property of the parameter, we see only one element. I'm going to continue with the execution of the application. I select a second element and look how this time in the count of current selection, we already have two selected elements that are part of type product. With this, we are getting the selected elements from the collection view. Once again, you will surely need to get the elements from the view model. For this, I'm going to return to the XAML file. Let's remove the event that we created previously. And the collection view also has a property called selected items with an S at the end that is going to allow us to establish a binding to a property, in this case, selected products. I'm going to copy the name of the property. Let's return to the view model and let's define the property that is of type list of products called selected products with its get and set. Again, for demonstration purposes, I'm going to turn this property into a full property, assigning the set a block body. I'm going to place a breakpoint on the set and I'm going to start running the application. Let's select some elements from the list, but notice that this time the breakpoint of this set is not being activated. What is happening is that each time that we select an element of the collection view, 
this is added to the list of the property, but it is not modifying the instance of the list with a new value, but it is modifying the internal values of the list. It is for this reason that an assignment is not executed in the set, since the list reference has not changed. What does change are the products of the list. What we have to do is to get the list items, but from a command. Let's see how to do it. I'm going to stop the execution of the application, return to the XAML file, and I'm going to set to the property called selection changed command a binding to a command called product changed command. Let's copy the name of this command, let's go back to the view model, and in the commands section, let's define a property of type i command called product changed command, which is equal to a new command. Let's specify a lambda expression without passing parameters, and let's create a variable called products list, which is equal to selected products, to see the list of products that have been selected. Let's place a breakpoint, and let's start the execution of the application. I'm going to select one of the items, and we see that we get to the command correctly. However, if we check the value of the variable, we see a null value. This is happening because the list of the selected products, that is, this property called selected products, must correspond to the data type of the collection view property. What do I mean by this? Well, I'm going to paste a piece of code, which is this one that we see here, in which I create a collection view. If we examine the selected items property, we can see that the data type of the property is a list, but it has as generic an object data type. Therefore, we must specify that the list of selected products must be of the same type. To comply with this, I will go back to the definition of the list and I will change the generic product by object, but for the private field and for the property. Another thing that is important to do as well is to initialize the product listing. In fact, as we have already tested with the complete property, I'm going to define the property as automated property. Once this is done, let's go back to the command and let's start once again the execution of the application. I'm going to select an element and I'm going to check again the values of product list. Notice that this time we are already getting the list of the selected products. I will select another product. I check the list again and we can already see the two products that have been selected from the collection view. This is the way in which we can deal with multiple elements of a collection view. To make a selection of elements from the view model in a collection view is something very easy to do in .NET MAUI. Let's see how to do it. In the view model of the page, we have defined a pair of properties that allow us to store the selected products in the control. These are the selected products property and the selected product property. It is this pair of properties that we must modify when we want to select items, either at the start of the application or as part of the execution of a command. Let's see how to preselect elements with the selected products property. For this, I'm going to go to the constructor of the view model and I'm going to access the selected products property, which is the one that will allow us to press select elements. I'm going to use the add method and as parameter, I will use the list of products, that is to say, the products property. We can use, for example, the skip method to skip five elements in the list and let's use the first or the foul method to obtain the sixth element. I'm going to duplicate this line and I'm going to change the number five for the number seven. With these changes, I'm going to start the application running. And look how once the application has been deployed, if we scroll down, we see the first item selected and a second preselected item, which we've selected thanks to this pair of lines that we've added. I'm going to stop the execution of the application. I'm going to go back to the XAML file and I'm going to comment out this collection view tag 
to uncomment the first collection view with a single selection mode. Since in this collection view we work with the selected product property, I'm going to go back to the view model and in the constructor I'm going to assign selected product, which is the property that we're binding to the collection view. A value equal to access the products property, I'm going to skip, for example, two elements and I'm going to get the third element. Again, I'm going to start the execution of the application. We can see that the third element has been selected correctly. This is the way in which we can select elements from a view model in a collection view. In this video, you will learn how to delete selections from a collection view. To perform this action, I'm going to go back to the XAML file. Before the collection view, I will create a grid to which I will assign a row definition to create a pair of rows. The first row will have 10% of space, while the second one, in which we will place the collection view, will have the remaining 90% of space. Once this is done, I'm going to create a button with a text equal to clear selection and a command equal to binding clear command that we have not created yet. Let's move the collection view to row number one. Once this is done, I'm going to copy the name of the command, I return to the view model, and in the section of the commands, I'm going to define a property of the type I command. I paste the name of the command, which will be equal to a new command, passing it a lambda expression without receiving parameters. Inside the command, I'm going to assign to the selected product property a value equal to null, and I will start the execution of the application. With the application initialized, we see the element that has been pre-selected. If I click on the button that says clear selection, see how the element stops being selected. Let's see how to do this, but with multiple selected elements. For this, let's return to the XAML file. I'm going to comment this collection view and to uncomment the collection view with multiple selection enabled. I'm going to place the control in the row number one. I return to the view model. And as the binding is to the selected products property, I'm going to assign selected products is equal to null. Let's see how the application works with this that we have added. We can see the set of elements that have been selected by default. I click on the button and look at how the items are no longer selected. This is how we can delete selections from a collection view from the view model. A list with data looks great, but what happens when there is no information in the data collection? Seeing a blank space can cause some kind of distrust in users, so it is always advisable to show feedback messages either because you search for something that has no results or because there was some kind of problem loading the information. Let's see how to do this in a practical way. I'm going to create in the views folder a new content page with the name empty view. Once I have created this new page, I'm going to paste a piece of code in which a collection view control is defined with an item source equal to a list of strings. It is this code that we see here. Next, I'm going to go to the app.saml.cs file to assign it as the initial page. With these changes, I'm going to start the execution on a Windows device. Here, we can see the application with the collection data. We see the text row sample in each row, which is the value of each string. What we are interested in seeing is that if we remove the strings from the list and save the changes, see how an empty collection is displayed. What would happen if you were in an application and you saw this blank space? You would probably think that the application is useless, or you might think that the application has failed without having received any feedback about what has happened. Therefore, it is of utmost importance that you know how to give that kind of feedback to users. The first way to give feedback is by using a property called empty view. 
to which we can assign a text to show the user that no data has been found. For example, let's set the string no data found. Save the changes and see how in the collection we already see the string we set, which shows us that no data was found to fill the list. This text will be displayed automatically every time the collection has no data. See what happens if I add data to the item source again. I save the changes, I return to the application, and the string of the empty view property no longer appears, but the data of the listing. Surely, the string displayed as part of the empty view property is not very appealing to you. Users may not even pay attention to the message at first glance because of how simple it is. This is why you should learn how to display custom views to give better feedback to users. Let's see how to do this with .NET MAUI. I'm going to remove the empty view property from the collection view, and instead I'm going to access the same property, but in a nested way. Inside this tag, we can create a layout that serves as a container, such as a grid. Inside the grid, I'm going to create a vertical stack layout with its vertical options equal to center. Here, I'm going to create a couple of controls, the first one that is an image with a height request equal to 150 units, a source equal to notfound.png, that is an image that you have already been able to download when you studied about the data display in the collection view. Let's also assign the vertical options property equal to center, and let's create a second label control with its font attributes equal to bold, its font size equal to large, horizontal text alignment equal to center, and finally, a text equal to no results. What we are doing is creating a custom view with a grid. You could make this view as complex as you need. Let's save the changes, back to the application, we see the data, I'm going to remove the data from the list, I save the changes again, and look how we can now see the graphical interface we created through the empty view property in a more customized way. We have placed an image and a label that shows that no results have been found, but you could put any element, even an animation that would give a better visual appearance to the empty list. We already know how to display a custom empty view. However, there may be times when a listing is empty for different reasons. For example, one case is when no results are found in a search box. Another case could be when no results are found due to an internet connection failure. And there can be many other scenarios for which a listing may be empty. The better feedback we give to the user will be much better, as the user will know how to react to different types of situations. Let's see how to select an empty view at runtime. The first thing we're going to do is to define a set of different views that we would like to display to the user. However, we currently have a problem, as notice that the empty view tag cannot contain data templates, which we used earlier. The collection view has the empty view template property, but we will use it in another section of the course when we know how to create bindable properties. For the moment, we're going to work with the empty view property, besides that it is going to serve you to know how to deal with this type of situations in case you find them in a real scenario. What we're going to do is to create the different views in the resource section of the content page, through the content page dot resources section. Then we will create a content view element, which we will study in more detail in another section. For the moment, you must know that a content view is a container that can group layouts or controls to be able to use them in a repetitive way. We must assign an X key to the same as all the resources that is equal to no results view. I'm going to move the grid that we defined in the empty view property towards the new content view. I'm going to create a copy of the content view, changing the X key for connectivity issue. To simulate that this view has to be shown when there is a connectivity problem. I'm also going to change the image to nointernet.png. 
And finally, the text is going to be equal to check your internet connection. With this, we have defined the pair of views that we will be able to display when there is no data in the collection view. Now, we should be able to select a view at runtime. I'm going to stop the execution of the application. The collection view, I'm going to nest it inside a grid to which we will define a pair of rows through row definition equal to dot two asterisk comma dot eight asterisk. Subsequently, as part of the grid, we will create a horizontal stack layout and inside I will create a first label control with a text equal to toggle empty views. I close the label and then I'm going to create a second switch control which will allow me to select one view or another depending on the value that the control has, whether it is selected or not. I'm also going to create the event handling for the event called toggled. I close the label and the last thing I'm going to do is to assign a grid.row to the collection view so that it is located in the row number one and to assign a name equal to collection view. Once we have done this, I'm going to go to the code behind of the page. We can see the event handler that has been created, in which I'm going to create a variable called isToggled. That allows me to obtain the result of e.value to know if the element is selected or not. And then I'm going to assign to the empty view property of the collection view one of the resources that we defined previously in the section of resources of the content page. How do we do this? Well, we're going to evaluate the variable is toggled to know if the switch is activated. If it is, we will access the resources section of the content page and we will look for the resource called no results view. Otherwise, we will get the resource called connectivity issue. Once this is done, let's start the application to see that everything works correctly. We already have here the application being executed. We do not see any result or data because the event handler has not been invoked. If we change the value of the switch, look how the view is displayed indicating that no results were found. If we change the value of the switch again, we see the second view, which indicates that there was an error in the internet connection and that for this reason, the collection is empty. Let's learn how to group data in a collection view control. To perform this action, we must group the data before it is displayed in the collection view control. This can be achieved by creating a list of groups, where each group is a list of elements. The group list must be an I enumerable type collection with a generic T, where T defines two pieces of data, a group name and an I enumerable collection that defines the elements belonging to a group. Let's see how to do this in a practical way, following a series of steps. First, we need a model that represents a single entity. In our case, we already have in the folder called models, this model called product which contains different properties. Once we have the model, we must create a class that represents a group of elements. We're going to create it in the models folder. I'm going to create a new class that I will call products group. I'm going to convert it into a public class and we will make it inherit from a list of products. With this, we indicate what type each of the groups in the collection view will be. In this case, we are indicating that each group will be a collection of products. We're going to create also as part of this class, a property called name that will represent each group of elements. I will also create a constructor of the class to which I will pass the name of the group and the collection of products of the group with the name products. We're going to invoke the base constructor passing the list of products to fill the information of the list of products. And finally, I'm going to assign to the property name the value that we pass in the constructor with the purpose that the group has a collection of products and a unique indicator to represent the grouping. 
Here we could create a grouping of the elements that begin, for example, with the letter A or another letter, or we could also create another type of grouping, where each set of products will be in a category, or any type of grouping that you need. Once we have created this model, which is the model of a group, the next step is to create a collection type I enumerable with the generic T, where T is the type representing a single group of elements. That is, in this case, each of these groups of elements will be an instance of products group. This collection with this generic is going to contain all the groups of collections that we need to deploy in the control. Let's see it in a practical way. I'm going to create in the view models folder a new view model called products view model with the purpose of not mixing the previous code. I'm going to convert this class into a public class and as part of this class I'm going to define a list of products group type elements. I will import the required namespace. I'm going to name the list products with its get and set and I'm going to initialize it. This is what I was referring to before, when I mentioned that we were going to have a list with a generic T representing a group of elements. In this way, we will maintain in this property a set of different groups, each one of them representing a specific group. I'm going to create also the constructor for this view model. Then I'm going to paste a method called load items, where the collection of products is initialized and through a return, the list of products is returned. Let's proceed to invoke this new method from the constructor, creating a variable called products that is equal to load items, which is a method I pasted previously. Here comes the interesting part. We have to create the grouping before showing it in the collection view control. How do we do this? Well, I'm going to create a new variable called grouped, which is equal to and I'm going to create a link queue expression in which we will make a query through from p in products. Later, we will order the products alphabetically. This with the purpose that we can display the products ordered alphabetically in the collection view. Let's then add an order by and use the name property of the products for the ordering. Once we have ordered the products, we're going to group them through the group class using the initial of the products to carry out the grouping. We achieve this with this syntax that I show you here. Let's access the name property, taking only the first character, which corresponds to the initial of each product. This way, we would be creating groups of products according to the letters of the alphabet. We have to perform a conversion to a string since it is a type we defined in the constructor of the products group class. We have a string type and it is for this reason that we perform the conversion to a string. Subsequently, we will continue the query with an into groups class, which creates a group of type I grouping. Finally, let's execute a select clause to convert each of these groups into the products group data type. Let us then create for each of these groupings a new instance of products group. We need to pass the pair of parameters that we defined as part of the constructor. First of all, what is the name of each group? In our case, we find it in the variable groups dot and we will use the key property, which is going to provide us with the identifier of each group and we are also going to pass the set of groups that we obtained as part of the query. Finally, running the toList method to match the type of the list obtained and that of the constructor. I place the semicolon and finally, I'm going to assign to the products property, which is the property that I defined at the beginning of the class, grouped.toList. This could be simplified in several ways. I show you the step by step so that you can see in detail what must be done. You could make the optimizations that you believe necessary. Once this is done, I will go back to the solution explorer and in the views folder, I will create a new view. I'm going to use the content page template and I'm going to call it products view. 
I'm not going to modify anything in this file yet. What I'm going to do is go to the code behind of this page to assign to the binding context a new instance of products view model. We have to import the namespace that is needed. I'm going to go to the app.saml.cs file to set this page as the initial page true main page equal to new products view. And finally, before starting the execution of the application, I'm going to go to the constructor of the view model and I'm going to place a breakpoint at the end of the constructor. I'm going to start the execution so that we can see what this code that we coded returns. Once we get to the breakpoint, we can analyze the information of the product's property. We see that we have 17 elements, that is to say, 17 groups of products have been created. Let's analyze some groupings and we see that, for example, the first element of the grouping has a count of two elements, the second group a count of three, and so on. Let's examine one of the groupings. We see that in the first group we have a couple of different products. If we look at the information for each of the products, we see that they have a product with the initial A, due to the ordering we did earlier. Also, if we click on raw view, we see that the name of this grouping is equal to the capital letter A, which is precisely what we have specified here. As I said before, you could make any type of grouping that you think necessary. In this way, we see that the grouping works correctly. The next task is to display the grouped data in the collection view, which we will do in the next video. Let's see how to display groupings in the collection view. To accomplish this task, I'm going to stop the execution of the application and go back to the XAML file, removing the default vertical stack layout. Instead, I'm going to create a collection view and as part of the properties of the collection view, I'm going to modify a first property called isGrouped, which will allow us to activate the grouping in the control. Next, I'm going to assign to the item source a binding to the products property. And I'm also going to define an items layout and an items template, which I'm going to paste so that you do not see me coding this. First, we define an items layout in which we indicate that the type of display is going to be a linear items layout with an item spacing and an orientation. As part of the items template, we create a frame control and inside a vertical stack layout with three controls, an image and two label controls to display the information in a very simple way. Each of these controls has a binding to different properties, which results in a very simple code. I'm going to start the application once again to see what this looks like. I'm going to remove this breakpoint and continue with the execution. We can already see the application. However, notice that at the beginning of each of the groupings, we do not see the group header, although we have already activated it previously in the collection view control. This is because we must define the visual appearance of the groupings, or each of the separations between each group. How can we do this? Well, as part of the properties of the collection view, we also have a property called group header template, which will allow us to define a data template with the visual structure we want for each of the groupings. In my case, I'm going to use only a label control with some properties. Here, the important thing is that I'm making a binding to a property called name. This name property is not the name of the product, but is the name of the group that we defined in the products group class. It is for this reason that we create a binding to the name property. With this change, if I restart the application, you can see that we already see a header that is displayed each time it starts a product group, as we see on the screen. It is the separation of gray color that I have defined. You can define the visual appearance that you want for each of these groupings. Another thing that is also possible when working with a collection view is to customize the footer of each of the groupings. How can we do this? Well, as part of the collection view control, we also have a property called group footer template, which will allow us 
to customize each of the endings of the groupings. Inside, we can define a data template, and again, you can define this data template as complex as you want. In my case, the only thing that I'm going to do is to create a label control. And here, the important thing is that we are assigning a text equal to a binding to the count property. Because we are creating a binding to the products property, which is a list of items, we have this property called count, which will allow us to obtain the number of products in a group. With this, we would be binding to the number of elements of the groups. Finally, we apply a string format to display the string total products followed by the number of products in the group. Let's see how this looks in action. We have the application here and look how when a group ends, we can already see this string that shows us the total number of products in each group. This is the way to create groups in a collection view. In the following videos, we're going to learn how to work with scrolling in the collection view. The first point that we're going to see is how to obtain values from the control when the scrolling is performed. To carry out this demonstration, I'm going to open the page that we created earlier. That is, the products view.saml file, in which we have a collection view control that we created earlier. As part of the properties of the collection view, we have an event that will be fired when the control is scrolled. This event is called scrolled. I'm going to create an event handler and later I'm going to go to the code behind where we can see the event handler that has been created. The event handler receives a parameter of type items view scrolled event args which has information in its properties about different values of the collection view. I have pasted a code that shows us some of these properties such as horizontal delta, vertical delta, horizontal and vertical offset, first visible item index, among other properties. I'm going to add a couple of additional lines with the purpose of seeing a separation between the sections. Once we have done this, I'm going to start running the application. With the application deployed on the device, I'm going to drag the list down. And we can see how in the Visual Studio output window, we are shown information about the status of the control. We can see interesting information such as the horizontal delta value, which has a value of zero since we don't have a horizontal offset as opposed to the vertical delta value, which does have a value. We can also see a horizontal offset and a vertical offset, which we could use to, for example, create a functionality that would allow us some effect, for example, parallax type in the background of the collection view. We can also see information about the elements of the control, such as which are the first element being displayed, which is the intermediate element, and the last element. This is how we can obtain information about the collection view control to execute some action. In this video, you will learn how to scroll to a specific item in the collection view. To perform this activity, I'm going to open the product class and add a whole new property called ID. I'm going to close this file and I'm going to edit the products view models file. We have to fill the information of the new property that we have added to the product model, for which, after creating the groupings of the products, I'm going to create a variable called ID that is equal to zero, that allows us to increment the ID of each product. Subsequently, through a for each, we're going to go through each of the groups. As the list is a grouping of groups of products, we must go through each of the groups and then, through another for each, we will go through each of the products that are in the group to assign them an ID using the variable that we declared previously. Once this is done, we're going to increase the value of the ID variable by one. With this, we're going to make sure that we fill the property correctly. Next, let's return to the SAML file. 
I'm going to nest the collection view inside a grid, assigning it a couple of rows, the first one having 10% and the second row having the remaining 90%. I'm going to move the closing tag and nest the collection view inside the grid. Next, I'm going to create a button assigning the text property a value equal to manual scrolling. And I'm also going to create an event handler for the clicked event. I'm going to close the button label and I'm going to position the collection view in row number one. I'm also going to modify the data template, removing the image control and instead I'm going to create a label with a text equal to a binding to the ID property. Finally, I'm going to comment both the group header template and the group footer template and save the changes. The next step is to indicate what to do when we click on the button. Before going to the event handler, I'm going to assign to the property X name a value equal to collection view so that we can access to the collection view from the code behind. Once this is done, we go to the code behind of the page. We can see the event handler, let's access the collection view reference and use a method called scroll to, which receives several parameters. Most of these parameters have a predefined value. The simplest use of the method is to pass an index to indicate to which element we want to navigate. Let's do a test and pass a value of 10 to go to the 10th element. With these changes, let's start running the application. Once the application has been deployed, we see that each of the products has an associated index. And let's see what happens when we press the button. Notice that as soon as we have pressed the button, we have navigated to the element with the ID equal to 10. So we see that the implementation is working correctly. Now, previously, we commented the sections of the group header template and the group footer template. And maybe you can ask yourself, what would happen if we try to use this pair of templates with the scroll to method? Well, Let's start again the execution of the application with the uncommented code. We can see again the headers and footers. I'm going to click again on the button. But notice that this time we are not navigating to the element with index number 10, but we are navigating to the element with index number 5. Before you think that the method is not working correctly, I want to show you the output so you can see what is happening. Notice that in the information display, we see that the last element being displayed is one with index number 10. So, what's going on? Well, what is happening is that an index is being taken into account for both the header and the footer. That is, it is taking into account this header and this footer, and the sum of the headers, footers, and products results in the element when the index number 10 is actually the product cake. With this, we come to the conclusion that this overload that we used previously is thought to be used only for lists that do not have headers and footers. What would happen then if you need to perform a scroll having headers and footers? Well, as part of the method, there is also a parameter called group index, which, theoretically, we could use to specify the index of a group and the index of the element in that group. However, this method has not given me very good results when I have tried to use it. So, the best way is to get the reference of the element we want to navigate to, and then use a different overload of the method. How can we do it? Well, in the event handler, I'm going to obtain the associated view model through the declaration of a variable called vm. And I'm going to assign it the binding context, carrying out a conversion to the associated view model, that is, product view model. Subsequently, I'm going to obtain the reference of a product to navigate to it. Then let's use the variable vm, we access the products property 
I'm going to execute the select many method to go through each one of the groups. Remember that in the collection view we have a collection of groups of products, therefore we have to use the select many method to subsequently select a single element whose ID corresponds, for example, to the index number 10. That is, I will navigate to the product with the ID equal to 10 and then once we have obtained the product with the index 10, which is a product data type, we can use an overload in which we do not pass an index, but we pass the reference of the element to which we want to navigate. Let's test the application to see how it behaves. Here we already have the application. I'm going to click on the button and notice how in this occasion we are already navigating correctly to the element with the index number 10, even when we have headers and footers in the collection view. As part of the scroll to method, we have some additional parameters that will allow us to add or remove functionality when navigating. For example, if we run the application again, we see that when we click on the button, an animation is executed that allows us to see a scroll to the desired element. We can remove this animation if we want to through one of the parameters of the scroll to method called animate assigning it a false value. If in this occasion we click on the button, see how no animation is executed and we go directly to the element that we have specified. Another thing that we can also do with this method is that if you have noticed in the previous demonstrations, the element has always appeared at the end of the list. This is due to a parameter in the scroll to method. Let's examine the method and look at the different values we can use in the overload. The one we are interested in is this scroll to position type parameter called position, which is going to allow us to set where we want to position the element once we navigate to it. If we examine the enumeration, we can see different values. The default value is this one called make visible. The default behavior is that as soon as the element is displayed in the collection view, the list stops and leaves the element in the first position in which it is displayed. In fact, if we visualize the application again, click on the button, the item appears at the bottom. However, if we navigate down and click on the button, see how the element appears at the top since it is the first position in which the element is displayed. We can also use the values start, center and end, which as you can imagine, will position the element we navigate to according to the value we specify. Let's make a test with the center value to indicate that we want to position the element in the center of the collection view control. Let's test the change by starting the application we click on the button and see how this time the element appears in the center of the collection view. I'm going to do it one more time and see how again the element appears in the middle of the collection view. This way we can control where the element we navigate to will appear. Another thing we can also do with the collection view is to control the scroll position when new elements are added. For example, Let's imagine a chat application. As soon as a message arrives to such an application, what we want is to navigate to the new element so that we can always visualize the new information. Let's see how we could achieve this with a collection view in .NET MAUI. I'm going to stop the execution of the application. After getting the view model, I'm going to add a new group to the collection of elements through the add method, passing a new instance of products group with a group name equal to new group. I place a comma before the parenthesis and I'm going to create a new list of products. I'm going to create a new product that is part of the group. I'm going to assign an ID equal to 100, a name equal to Bitcoin and a price equal to a set of nines. I'm going to comment out the scroll to method. 
and with this we are simulating the addition of a new grouping to the collection view. What we want to accomplish is to scroll to this new element once it has been added to the control. Let's go back to the XAML file and the collection view has a property called items updating scrolling mode in which we can use three different values keep items in view, keep last item in view and keep scroll offset which are going to allow us to control what will happen when we add a new item. According to the documentation, the first value called keep items in view is going to allow us to keep the first item in the list when new items are added. The third value called keep scroll offset is going to allow us to ensure that the current scroll position is maintained when new items are added. And the last value called keep last item in view is going to allow us to adjust the scroll to show the last item in the list when new items are added. Let's see the keep last item in view value in action, which is the one we would need for a chat application. Let's start the application running to see how it behaves. We can already see the listing, let's click on the manual scrolling button, but we see that nothing is happening. Even we do not see in the collection view the new created element. Why is this happening? Well, this is happening because we are using a normal list in the view model. If we examine the product property, we see that it is a normal list. To fix this problem easily, we need to use the observable collection data type. Let's import the required namespace and replace each of the lists with an observable collection. Also, as part of the assignment to the products property, we have to create a new observable collection with a generic products group. And in parentheses, let's pass the normal list to create the new observable collection. The observable collection type already has the functionality implemented to notify changes to the graphical interface when objects are added or removed from the list. If we run the application again, click on the button, see how it automatically navigates to the last item in the list, which is the one we just added. This is how we can control what happens when new items are added to the list. Another point that is also important to highlight is that we can control the snap points of a collection view. What does this refer to? Well, this refers to the functionality of the collection view to duck the elements at a point of the collection view and not to see a normal scroll as we are seeing here, but the elements are ducked to the collection view according to the specified value. Let's see this in a practical way. As part of the collection view, we have a couple of properties to perform the snap. These properties, we are going to find them in the item layout used. In this case, as we are using a linear items layout, we're going to do it from here. We can see a couple of properties. The first one called snap points type, which contains three different values. By default, the value known is used, but we also have the mandatory value and the mandatory single value available. The mandatory single value is going to allow us to scroll through the collection view items one at a time, while Mandatory is going to allow us to scroll through the list, but as soon as we get to a specific item, the item will automatically reset itself to be displayed in full in the collection view. Let's see this in action, testing the mandatory value to see how it behaves. We can also set another property called snap points alignment, which will allow us to control how the snap points are aligned with the elements whether at the start, center or end. Let's test the functionality with a start value and start the execution so you can see the behavior. See how if we start scrolling through the collection view, nothing different seems to happen. However, if we stay in the middle of an element and release the mouse, Watch how automatically the element is positioned so that we can see it completely. Let's do the test one more time with another item in the list and see how it again adjusts so that we can see it completely. Let's now test the mandatory single value. 
Let's start the application running once again. Once the application is running, notice that if we scroll down, the scrolling happens one time at a time. It does not scroll as it normally does, but with mandatory single, it scrolls one at a time through the list in order to get to the next item. This works both up and down the list. This is how we can control the snap points of the collection view elements.